Ecology is the study of organisms and their environment. And ecology is studied at several different levels, from individuals and populations to biomes and even the entire biosphere. Organismal ecology is the study of how individual organisms interact with their environment. Specifically, it's the study of the morphological, physiological, and behavioral adaptations of individuals. Organismal ecologists look at how morphological differences among individuals in a population affect their fitness. In this way, it can be said that Charles Darwin was an organismal ecologist, but he probably wouldn't have called himself that. Organismal ecologists also include the study of behavior within populations. Behavioral ecology is a study of the ecological and evolutionary basis for an animal's behavior and the roles of behavior in enabling an animal to adapt to its environment. So an organismal ecologist studying salmon would possibly look at mating behaviors between individuals of salmon. Population ecology is a subfield of ecology that deals with the dynamics of species, population, and how these populations interact with their environment. Specifically, it's the study of how the population size of a species living together in groups changes over time. So a population ecologist studying salmon would look at the number of salmon within a stream and calculate their population change over time. In ecology, a community is an assemblage of two or more populations of different species occupying the same geographical area. So community ecology is a study of interactions among different species and communities in a given area. So a community ecologist might study the effects of predation of bears on salmon. Ecosystem ecology moves beyond species and it looks at how nutrients and energy moves through different ecosystems. Ecosystem ecology examines the physical and biological structures and examines how these ecosystem characteristics interact with each other. So an ecosystem ecologist might study the nutrient load affected by the death of the spawning salmon. What determines where a particular species can live on Earth? And why don't species live in many different biomes? Why can't I grow a cactus in New York? You may be wondering these questions. But maybe not. <laughs> Nevertheless, the range of a species is what geographical area of its distribution that that particular species has and it's largely determined by physical factors such as temperature and precipitation. These are known as abiotic factors. So why can't you grow that cactus in New York? Well, at least outside. Well, the reason is that all organisms are adapted to certain environments, and this is because of fitness trade-offs. Because of these fitness trade-offs, organisms are adapted to a limited set of abiotic factors. Imagine humans before we begin to make our own clothing. We were perfectly adapted to the hot climates of Africa. However, as we began to expand our ranges north, we had to cover our skin. Naked humans would never exist in the north. But having a bunch of hair for fleas to attach to doesn't make any sense in Ethiopia either. Biotic factors also play a role in species distribution. However, it's not nearly as important as the abiotic factors in most organisms. Competition is the driving ecological biotic force that can severely determine a species distribution. If a new species comes into an ecosystem and is much more competitive than another species, over time the new species will reduce the range of the other species. Similar results can also happen with parasitism and disease. Nearly all of the biomes on Earth are dictated by two factors, how much sun they receive and how much water they receive. And the amount of water they receive is related to how much sunlight they receive. At the equator, the sun is directly overhead so it has the most amount of sunlight per unit area of any other latitude. At the middle latitudes, there is a moderate angle of incoming light, creating moderate temperature changes. And at low latitude, there is the lowest angle of incoming light, giving the smallest amount of sunlight per unit area. This is a map of global light intensity. And as you know, the Earth is round. So the sun hits the Earth with greater intensities based on latitude. At the equator, the light intensity is far greater than the poles, and this is the major determinant determining the position of the Earth's biomes. Seasons are caused by the Earth's natural tilt on its axis, known as its angle of incidence. In the northern latitudes, the Earth is tilted closer towards the sun in the summer months and further away from the sun in the winter months. This determines our seasons. 
That is why up north it's cold in the winter and warm in the summer. And the opposite is true in the summer latitudes. Their summer is our winter, and their winter is our summer. The Hadley cell is a tropical atmospheric circulation cell, which is caused by the intense nature of the sun at the equator. The sun is most intense directly at the equator. Since the light is most intense at the equator, the air there greatly expands and rises. In addition, warm air has a greater ability to hold moisture. So directly at the equator, hot, wet air rises. And as it rises, it cools, and the gaseous water condenses into liquid. This is why the tropical forests of the world are so lush. They have the most sunlight and the most water of any place on Earth. But that's only half of the story of the Hadley cell. As the warm, wet air masses rise, they leave a vacuum behind them. As the warm air reaches the upper limits of the atmosphere, the air mass moves equally in a northerly and southerly direction, raining along the way. When it gets to around 30 degrees, north and south, those air masses descend back to the surface of the Earth, but they're almost completely devoid of water. While this is happening, the air masses are actually gaining a water holding capacity. This means that if there is any moisture in the air, it gets quickly locked up into the air mass and doesn't precipitate. This is the fundamental phenomenon that creates the world's great deserts, from the Gobi to the Chihuahua to the Sahara. And some of the driest places on Earth occur at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Hadley cells are the circulation patterns that exist from 0 to 30 degrees. There's also two other circulation patterns, both in, in both hemispheres. The other notable features of these circulation patterns occur around 60 degrees north and south. At these latitudes, there's a similar rise in the air masses. And as the air masses rise, they cool and condense, creating fairly wet pattern around 60 degrees. And this is why areas such as England, New York, and Seattle are so wet. Regional effects can also have a tremendous impact on the temperature and moisture. And temperature and moisture are the predominant factors of what grows where. There are two major regional effects that determine what grows where. The rain shadow effect occurs when mountains exist. When air masses move toward mountainous regions, the air rises. And as the air rises, it cools because the higher up you go in the atmosphere, the colder it is. And as the air cools, the gaseous water condenses, creating rain. This effect is dramatic in especially tall mountains like the Cascade Mountains of the Pacific Northwest, shown in this example here, or the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. The mountains are so tall that they strip the air mass of nearly all the moisture, except in freakishly big, big and moist air masses. And the result of this is a tremendous amount of precipitation in these mountainous regions. However, this effect also creates high deserts on the opposite sides of the mountain. And we see this on the other side of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. That is where the Mojave Desert is, and it's very, very dry. So while the Sahara Desert is cold, caused by a global effect, from the Hadley cell, because it's centered around 30 degrees north, the Mojave Desert is caused by a regional effect. Another important regional effect is known as the ocean moderation effect. Water has a tremendous capacity for storing energy. Because of this phenomenon, areas near oceans can absorb a great deal of heat from the atmosphere in the summer when the water temperature is cooler than the air temperature. As a result, the ocean moderates summer temperatures on land masses very close to the ocean. And if that weren't awesome enough, the ocean also releases heat to the atmosphere in winter, when the water temperature is warmer than the air temperature. As a result, coastal areas have much more moderate climates than inland areas. It's no wonder that everyone wants to live at the beach. You get the best of both worlds. In the next several slides, we'll discuss the world's major biomes, both aquatic and terrestrial. The most important determinant of what biome will exist where is a function of temperature and rainfall. And these are not just factors of the average temperatures and rainfall, but how variable they are. Tropical rainforests all occur very near the equator. And at the equator, the temperature is always hot. And even more than that, the temperature hardly ever changes. It's hot all the time. What does change is the amount of precipitation, that is the amount of rain. In many tropical rainforests, there are two seasons, the rainy season and the dry season. Tropical rainforests are the biomes that have the most biomass and they have the highest amount of biodiversity. They're also characteristically multi-layered with two, 
three, or even four layers of trees. Light is abundant at the very topmost layer, while at the floor, light is all but non-existent. At the other end of the spectrum are subtropical deserts. These deserts are found throughout the world in two distinct latitudes, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And most of the world's great deserts are subtropical deserts, the Sahara, the Gobi, the Sonoran, and even the Australian outback. And they're all characteristically formed as a consequence of the Hadley cell. Subtropical deserts are characterized by having high average temperatures that varies moderately. They also have very, very low precipitation and, as a consequence, very, very low biomass. Most of these plants are widely spaced apart due to a high level of competition for water. When I think of temperate grasslands, I'm brought back to my homeland, Oklahoma. I remember long, warm summers, if you can call 105 degrees for 30 degrees straight warm, and short, bitterly cold winters. Overall, there's very low precipitation, which is why trees are infrequent. Also, another factor controls the growth of woody plants. Fire. Fire is very common in grassland, and without it, the grasses would eventually become shrublands. Timber forests of North America include the Appalachian Mountains from South Carolina to Maine, and the Rocky Mountains. These environments have a temperature scheme very similar to grasslands, but with significantly higher precipitation. They also typically have a defined winter, with skiing, snowmobiling, and snow angels. Compared with the world's other ecosystem, they have moderate productivity in terms of biomass, and moderate biodiversity, and is predominated by deciduous trees. They're like the Goldilocks biome, and they sure are pretty in the autumn. Just above the temperate rainforest are the boreal forests, known as the Tyaga. They're really defined by their temperature. They have a very cold, very long winter with short, cool summers. The temperature variation is extreme and the amount of precipitation is limited. However, there's very little evaporation due to the cold temperatures. As a result, trees can grow. These ecosystems are dominated by the gymnosperms, conifers, and they include the pines, spruces, and firs. And even though there's a high bio biomass, there's low productivity. These trees grow very, very slowly. And there's not a lot of species that can tolerate these kind of conditions, so biodiversity is extremely low. And if that weren't inhospitable enough, go to the tundra. These are areas within the Arctic Circle that are not covered by ice 365 days a year. And they have very, very low temperature and very, very low amounts of precipitation. In fact, the growing season of the tundra is limited to about six weeks, eight weeks in a freakishly good year. There is cold, and then there's tundra cold. And only a small part of the soil melts. Underneath that is what is known as the permafrost. It is permanently frozen. And to the plants, it might as well be solid rock. This ecosystem is dominated by really short woody shrubs and herbaceous plants. And there's a whole bunch of lichen. Reindeer live in the tundra, and nearly their entire diet consists of the lichen that grow there. There are also very distinct aquatic ecosystems. Lakes and ponds are freestanding bodies of water that don't receive any water from the ocean or sea. All their water comes from rain. And in lakes and ponds, there are distinct zones where specific organisms reside. At the edge of a lake is known as the littoral zone, and it's where you'd find plants that are rooted into the ground. This is a great place for these plants because they have the substrate to root in and they have enough sunlight to effectively go through photosynthesis. And in Florida, the littoral zone is also where alligators will eat you. Be wary of the littoral zone. Free-floating photosynthetic organisms can be found in the limnetic zone or the littoral zone, and collectively these are known as the photic zone. The limnetic zone is the zone offshore, but still has enough sunlight so that photosynthetic organisms can make enough sugar to survive. The benthic zone is the bottom of the lake or pond and includes the entire bottom. And this is most likely where you would find detritivores, or organisms that are consuming dead matter after it floats down. Areas that are relatively shallow and really wet typically form freshwater wetlands. And they're differentiated from lakes and ponds in that they have emergent plants, or plants that come out of the water. 
There are three types of freshwater wetlands. Bogs are stagnant, meaning that there's no water flowing out of the bog, and they're typically acidic, and they're also usually really stinky. Marshes are a group of freshwater wetlands that are predominated by non-woody plants, typically grasses, whereas swamps are predominated by emergent trees and shrubs, like the cypress swamps of Florida. Streams and rivers are freshwater ecosystems with a flow in a single direction. Compared to estuaries, they flow in two directions based on the tides. The source of the river is usually very cold, narrow, and fast. And this is where I like to go kayaking. Yeah, I shred the gnar. However, in terms of organism, there isn't a lot going on at the top. It's just too cold and too fast. So there aren't, aren't really a lot of organisms at all. And those that are there are mostly animals. But at the mouth of the river, the water is typically warm and the river is wide and it moves really slow. Boring if you ask me. But these conditions allow plants to take roots and you'll also see a lot more animals. Where the river meets the ocean is a special ecosystem that lives in two worlds, known as an estuary. But they're slightly saline due to the incoming tide from the ocean. But they're also constantly refreshed with fresh water from the rivers. The salinity that is present at a given area is dependent on a few factors. It's dependent on the strength of the tide. As you know, Earth's tides are a factor of the moon's gravitational pull on water. However, the effect isn't the same across the entire globe. The closer the moon is to the surface of the Earth, the stronger the tide. And since the Earth is a sphere, there are very different effects of the moon on tide. The amount of fresh water coming into the river system also affects the salinity levels. If there's a drought, the salinity levels in the estuaries will rise, and when there's heavy rains, the salinity level will fall. Furthermore, salinity levels in estuaries are also caused by the proximity to the oceans. The closer the estuaries are to the oceans, the more salt they'll have, and the further away, the less salt they'll have. And the changes in salinity affect the organisms that exist there. Osmosis has changed because the water balance and the salinity levels are different. Some species have adaptations for dealing with this, but other species are restricted to very specific salinity levels. Intertidal zone is an area where the land meets the sea, and it's alternately submerged and exposed by the daily cycle of tides. Therefore, the resident organisms are subject to huge daily variations in temperature, light intensity, and availability of water. Plant life can be quite limited because the sand or mud is constantly being shifted by the tide. However, animal life can be quite diverse. On the rocky shore, sea anemones, snails, hermit crabs, and small fishes can live in tide pools. On rock faces, there may be a variety of animals such as mussels, sea stars, sea urchins, snails, and sponges. At low tides, organisms may dry out, and they are also vulnerable to predation by a variety of animals, including birds and mammals. But the high tides are no picnic. They bring predatory fishes from the sea. Corals need warm water of at least 20 degrees, but less than 30 degrees Celsius. They're also limited to the photic zone, where light penetrates. Sunlight is important because many of the corals harbor symbiotic algae, known as dianoflagellates, that contribute nutrients to the animals and that require light to live. The immense variety of microorganisms, invertebrate, and fishes living amongst the coral make it one of the most interesting and species-rich biomes on Earth. And in fact, it's thought that 40% of all fish species on Earth are found within these coral reefs. Herbivores such as snails, sea urchins, and fishes exist there, and these are consumed by octopuses, sea stars, and carnivorous fishes. Many species are brightly colored, warning predators of their toxic nature. The open ocean is sometimes known as the pelagic zone, where water depth averages about 4,000 meters. Nutrient concentrations are typically low, though the waters may be periodically enriched by ocean upwelling, the circulation of cold, mineral-rich nutrients from deep water to the surface. Pelagic waters are mostly cold, only warming near the surface. In the photic zone, many microscopic photosynthetic organisms known as phytoplankton grow and reproduce. Phytoplankton account for nearly half of all the photosynthetic activity on Earth and produce much of the world's oxygen. Open ocean organisms also include zooplankton. These are minute animal organisms consisting of some worms, seapeds, 
tiny shrimp-like creatures, small jellyfish, and small invertebrate and fish larvae that graze on the phytoplankton. The open ocean also includes free-swimming animals, collectively known as nectin, like whales and dolphins. And these can swim against the currents to locate food. They also include large squids, fishes, and sea turtles. The benthic region of the ocean is the bottom of the ocean, and it begins at the shoreline and extends downward along the surface to the continental shelf out to sea. And benthos are the organisms which live in the benthic zone. And they're different from those organisms that live elsewhere in the water column. Many are adapted to live on the bottom. Many organisms adapted to live in deep water pressure cannot survive in the upper parts of the water column. The pressure difference can be very significant. Because light doesn't penetrate very deep in the ocean water, the energy source for most benthic organisms is often organic matter from higher up in the water column, which drifts down to the depths. This dead and decaying matter sustains the benthic food chains, where most organisms in the benthic zones are scavengers or detritivores.